right. Hello and welcome to Kick-Ass Brand Show. I'm Andre Mink, I'm the founder of Trademark Factory. And today I have an amazing guest for you. I have Jeb Blount, who is a sales acceleration specialist and the author of 12 books, including Fanatical Prospecting, Sales EQ, Objections, Inked, and his latest bestseller, Virtual Selling. He's among the world's most respected thought leaders in prospecting, sales, leadership, and customer experience. Through his global training organization, Sales Gravy, Jeb advises a who's who of the world's leading organizations and their executives on the impact of emotional intelligence and interpersonal skills on customer-facing activities. So that's the formal introduction that I got from Jeb, but this is going to be an amazing episode. We've had some great uh, conversation with Jeb before, and I'm really excited that he's joining us today. Welcome, Jeb. Thank you for having me on. We have tried so hard to put this podcast together. I feel terrible. Uh, it's been, it's been. We just had such an amazing month, and it's been so busy. So I'm. I thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm truly grateful, and you know, you you deserve a standing ovation just for hanging in there to try to, you know, to 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 to, to just be patient while I could get on your schedule. So thank you. You know, ever since I read the uh, fanatical prospecting, I was like. This is amazing, and then I and then I listened to the to the to the audio book, the same book, and uh, then we connected one on one. And uh, when I realized that we could have this podcast together, I was so excited. So, trust me, if you had to reschedule again, I probably would have hung on <laughs> still. So, uh, I'm gl I'm glad that we're doing it today, though. So, um, look, I've got a million questions I want to ask you, of course, but uh, let's start with. First things first, are you a natural born salesman? You know, that's a question that people ask all the time. In fact, they ask the question about are there such, you know, are there, is there a such thing as a natural born salesman? And what I'll tell you is there's a such thing as talent. So there are people who have the talent to play professional golf. There are people who have talent to be lawyers, teachers, you know, fi you know firefighters. There, there are people who have the talent to sell. There are people who have talent to lead. And, and so everybody's got a set of talents that they're born with. There are some people who do not have the talent to be in professional selling. That's just the truth. But those folks have great talents for other things. There are some people who have the talents to be in professional selling, but not necessarily to go out and hunt for new logos. They've got the talent to build deep relationships and work in account management. There are people who have talent all over the different spectrum of salespeople. Some people, by the way, have the talent to, to work in you know, transactional, really fast moving, high velocity sales. There are people who are really, really good at really complex, high risk, big deals. So, so the answer to your question is, I have the talent to be in sales. And it was, a, it was talent that I was born with. But I, didn't, I wasn't born a good salesperson. I was made a good salesperson by great coaches and great leaders and by reading and studying and honing the craft. Just like Michael Jordan, greatest basketball player, will 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 we'll say that in my generation, greatest basketball player of all time, he he wasn't he wasn't born Michael Jordan that we knew, like Air Jordan. He was made Michael Jordan that we knew because of coaching and because of the leaders and the mentors that he worked with. And I was very fortunate to have great leaders and mentors in my life who took this talent, this thing that I gravitated to because of the talent, and turned me into a really good salesperson. When and how did you actually know that you wanted to make sales and sales training really your career? Well, you know, making sales training my career kind of, you know, early on when I first became a leader, uh, I, I worked for a company called Nutrisystem early on in my career. And I was, I was an area manager. I was, you know, in my early 20s. I was 23 years old, way over my head, way over my depth in what I should have been doing. But I managed seven of their profit centers and I loved the salespeople and we, we were a selling organization. And what I found that I was gravitating to was teaching. Like I loved teaching people and I enjoyed it. And, and so I, you know, I got good at it and I was, I got, I was, I was, I got good at being able to take complex ideas and break them into things that were simple. So I'd say in my early twenties, that was my gift. And people always told me like, you need to, like, you need to go into sales training and do this. 
But in the corporate world, I didn't want to be a sales trainer because I couldn't make as much money as I could selling stuff. So I would do it on the side. Like I would always at sales meetings, I would be the person teaching something or at their big, you know, big natural conference. They would, they would always have me on stage giving a speech of some type. Mm. So I did that. But, you know, early on, like even when I was in high school, I worked for the yearbook. Like I was on the yearbook in 11th grade. And, you know, that year I sold $3,700 in ads for the yearbook when the quota was wow. 300 bucks. And I just walked around, knocked on doors and ended up, you know, like becoming the editor of the yearbook because of that. So, and, and, and it wasn't because I was good, Andrea. It was just because I knocked on doors. Like I just went out and talked to people. Most of the people in the yearbook staff went home and talked to their mom. I went and talked to business owners. So I knew then that I was good at it and I just gravitated to it mostly because I could call my own shots. Like I remember in my early 20s, I was working for a really big company and I'm looking at my sales manager and my sales manager is like, well, I need you to be here for this meeting and this meeting and this meeting and this meeting. And I'm like, am I outselling everybody? He goes, yep. And I go, so like I've earned the right to not have to kill all these meetings. And he went, yep. And I go, well, I'm not coming to those meetings. I said, when I stop selling more than anybody, I'll work on your schedule. Until then, you're working on my schedule. And he went, all right, sounds good. And by the way, that's how I run my sales team. Like, you're outselling everybody. You tell me what the schedule is. We'll work through your thing. But you're not outselling everybody. You're on my schedule. So I just found that it gave me freedom. It gave me income. It allowed me to be Babe Ruth at the plate, you know, the proverbial plate, pointing to the stands and calling my shots. It allowed me to set goals that I could achieve. And it allowed me to advance through organizations because if I could make it rain, then then I got all the rewards. I got all the spiffs. I went all the trips. I got all the trophies. And and that's what I that's that's why I chose it. Uh, and I kept choosing it. And I'm, I'm still choosing it today. I mean, so it's you know, sales has, has, has served me very well in my life. I don't know if you answered this already. You may have. Um, do you remember your first sale you've ever made or was this this $37,000 ad thing in college? Yeah, th yeah $3,700 on the, you know, on the, oh, on the, the, yeah, the yeah. yearbook. But, you know, probably if you go back further than that, you know, the, the first sale that I ever made was I set up this little business. I lived out in the country in Georgia on a farm and all around us were farms. And if you're on farms all the time, you've got animals and animals have a tendency to die at some point. Like, mm. so they're, something's going to kill them. Weird. And, and the problem with animals dying, like chickens and, you know, baby goats and you like, you name it. Like there's all kinds of stuff that can die. Cats is that there, on every farm, there's also dogs. Like everybody's got a dog and the dogs like to chew up the dead things. And usually they would drag them under somebody's house. And there's this dead thing that's stinking under their house. This, I mean, it's growing up in the country in Georgia. Okay. If you're in a big city, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but but dead things stink. So I figured out that like one of my neighbors called one day and said, hey, there's this dead cat under our house. Can, you know, can anybody come get it out there? And I said, well, sure, I'd do it. I said, but I'll, it's $15. And they said, we'll pay you like anything because there's a dead cat under their house and it's rotting and it stinks. So I crawled under there and got the dead cat out and they paid me. I was like, okay, well, this works. So I started a business that was a basically a dead animal burial business. Were you were using and, the same cat over and over again? No, I know I wasn't doing that. And I wasn't going and putting the cat under. People would say that, but I didn't do that. So because the dogs were, there was always something dead. So I got really good at burying dead things. I, I had to like, I had a couple of jobs that were pretty big. I had to bury cow once and that was a lot of shoveling, but, but I would, I went all to all the farms and I would knock on the doors and say, listen, if anything dies and you don't want to bury it, or in a lot of cases, they would bury it the first time because they thought they could do it. And then I would, you know, the, the dogs would dig it back up and then it would stink again. And then they would call me and then it would cost more after they did it the second time. So, but I just went around and told people. So those are the very first sales that I was making. How old was, were you then again? I was 12, 13, 14, wow. somewhere in that neighborhood. Wow. I needed money. I was like, I lived on a farm. I didn't have any money. So, you know, burying dead animals, $15 here and there, you know, you could, you could go down and buy a Coke or have something to, you know, to, uh, to drink. And, you know, it was, uh, it was good. Yeah. And now here you are. Now here I am. Le leading the empire. Leading the empire. I don't, I don't bury dead animals anymore. <laughs> Speaking of the empire. I take that back. I take that back. I did bury a dog. I buried a dead animal last year. So that's not true. Hmm. Speaking of the empire and sales gravy, how'd you come up with a name? Why is sales gravy? So it's a, 
It's a long story. I'll, I'll try to shorten it. So back in 2006, when I came up with the idea to start the company, so we're right in the middle of, the, we're, we're right at the beginning of the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't realize this. We always think about the Great Recession really hitting us hard in 2000, 2008. But 2006, we were already seeing the signs. I lived in Florida. A lot of the things were telling us there's something happening here. So I started thinking about like starting a business and doing something different because I was getting ready for what was I thought was going to happen to me, which did happen to me, which is the company I worked for. There was a collapse and I had to go do something else. So I came up with the idea to create a sales website because sales served me well. It was what I knew how to do. And the sales web website was going to be called Sales Professionals Online. Mm -hmm. And I was going to build all this content for salespeople and sell ads. Dumb idea. But that's what I was going to do. And, and it was the fall of 2006 and I'm sitting in Orlando with a buddy of mine. I've got a web team building out the website. You know, I've got all the plans done. He's in digital marketing and I'm telling this idea. I'm so excited about it, Andre. I'm like, I've got this great idea. It sells professionals online. And he just looks at me and the look on his face wasn't what I was expecting. I was expecting, yes, what a great idea. And he looks at me and he says, that's a terrible name. I'm like, what do you mean it's a terrible name? He says, it's a terrible name. He says, nobody's ever going to remember that. It's too long. It doesn't make any sense. He goes, you need something else. So I remember leaving that restaurant. I was in University Avenue. I'll never forget it. Orlando, Florida. I left that restaurant and I'm, I'm like dejected, depressed. Like my entire dreams, all of my dreams for the future are wrapped up in sales professionals online. I got people working on the website. So I call my web developers and I'm like, it ain't going to be sales professionals online. It's got to be something else. So then I started looking for salesblank.com anything. Now this is 2006, okay? So this is a long time ago if you really think about it in terms of the web. Yep. Today it's even worse. Like go try to find salesblank. There was nothing I could find out that I liked. So Thanksgiving, US Thanksgiving, I'm in, um, I'm in Captiva Island at a little place called Tween Waters, one of my favorite places in the world. And my family and I are there having Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there eating and the waiter comes by and he's got a gravy boat and he asks you want some gravy on your mashed potatoes. And as soon as he said it, I was like, oh, I got it. And right in the middle of Thanksgiving dinner, didn't say anything to my wife, didn't say to my son. I just got up. The last thing my wife saw was me running, sprinting across the parking lot. And it's like this dirt parking lot right, right, right on the beach, sprinting across the parking lot, going to the office of the hotel for Tween Waters. And I ran into the office huffing and puffing, and there's this young lady, I mean, maybe she's 16, but she's back there and she's on the computer. Now again, 2006, we weren't really carrying, like I wasn't carrying a computer in my pocket the way we do now. Yep. You know, the iPhone, I didn't have an iPhone back then. I think I had a Blackberry or something. It wasn't like you could surf the web. I, wasn't, I didn't have a laptop sitting there. And uh, so I, like she was there and I elbowed her off the computer. I said, I have an emergency. I need to use your computer right now. <laughs> and like, she just went, and before she could do anything, I'm on the computer. Blah, 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 blah. And on Thanksgiving day, 2006, I registered salesgravy.com. And, and the reason it hit me was because my entire life, I talked about gravy. Like I said, you know, in sales, if you're doing the right things, you get gravy. Like the things happen to you, you get things that drop in your lap that you weren't even thinking about because you were in the right place, right time, doing the right thing. And, and, and that's what we did. We called it sales gravy that day. So went back to my buddy and said, what do you think about sales gravy? He goes, you got a winner. Like nobody's ever going to forget sales gravy. And the truth is, you know, and I know this is about branding is that we have over the years considered changing the name of the company. Hmm. And it, at one point we were con concerned because as we were going up market and we were working with bigger companies and the story of how we got into the place we are now is a little bit longer story, but we were going up market into much bigger companies. So fortune 200, fortune 100 companies worldwide. There was a concern that our name wasn't corporate enough. Like sales gravy was a little bit too, you know, weird. Mm -hmm. And, and so we were thinking about, you know, calling it like Jeb Blunt International, which is, I, I own that company. That is one of my companies. That company owns uh, all of my intellectual property and copyrights and everything. So it's a place where that, that goes. Mm -hmm. So we're like JBI, you know, or, you know, Jeb Blunt International, something like that. And I never really wanted the brand to be about me. I wanted it to be a bigger brand primarily because if it's all about me, then I'm always the center of the universe and the company can never scale without me. Uh, and, uh, and, and 
you know, and, and I don't know, would Jeb Blunt be, you know, be something that people will remember? My last name, you know, you say Blount because that's what a lot of people say. I call it Blunt. If you look at it, it's, it's spelled like Blount. So I'm thinking, okay, well, that's probably not going to work for me. So there was like all of these considerations are coming up with something like, you know, um, JBI Associates or something. But we, we came back to, you know, nobody forgets sales gravy. Like nobody ever forgets that. And, 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 and as we kept going back to it, we, we were like, we need to own this. Like we need to stop running away from it and say, it's not a, you know, a corporate style brand. We just need to own it. Mm-hmm. And it is who we are. And that's what we did. And we've been able to go up market, work with, you know, the premier organizations in the world. People know our name and you either love it or like it, and but you won't forget it. And I think part of branding is that it's something that people don't forget. Absolutely. You know, it's funny because it's very similar to you know, how I started uh, with this business. Right? The czar of trademarking, uh, my original company name was Mink of Low Corporation. Like you can't come up with a more boring way to call your company. <laughs> and then I came up with the idea of Trademark Factory a couple of years later. And uh, when I did, it was like, if I'm going to do trademarks, if I'm going to talk to brands about importance of branding, I can't be Mink of Low Corporation. Right? Yes. <laughs> this just doesn't make any sense, right? So we became Trademark Factory. And um, so question for you, so since you've trained I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands of businesses on sales, and what's your perspective of why it's so much easier to be successful at making offers and you know having conversion, having sales, when you have a recognizable brand that's backing you up. Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, if you think about it, let's just say you're you know you're a new salesperson and you work for a Jeb Software Company, and you're competing against a salesperson who works for Microsoft. The Microsoft rep's going to have a whole lot easier you know time getting through the door and having the conversation because Microsoft is a recognizable brand. It's a brand where the company's done a great job of building trust. So when people trust, they, 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 they believe in it. It means something to them. And Microsoft, in some ways, is a celebrity brand, you know, because it's, you know, it's a brand that like, was attached to Bill Gates for so long, who wrote books and people worshipped you know, Bill Gates, and they still do to some extent. So, so when you've got brand recognition and people know who you are, it's much easier to get in. So... That's the truth. Not, not everybody's going to work for a Microsoft and not everybody's going to work for a, a, a major brand, na- brand name. But for example, if you're in local, if you're a local brand and you're advertising all the time and you're out there and people know your name and you've built your, you know, your brand recognition and the salesperson calls from your brand, as soon as they hear the name, there's a level of familiarity and familiarity has a way of, of leading to liking. So if there's brand recognition and there's liking, what all that does is increase the probability that the person says yes to the request that they meet with you. And that's all we're really doing in sales is we're just bending probability in our favor. So the better your brand recognition and the more people trust your brand, right? So if I, if I trust the brand itself, the more likely that they're going to, to, to meet with me then then you're, as a business owner, you're giving your salespeople a much better shot. So if people don't know who you are, like, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's important. They, they may not know who you are if you're starting off. I mean, I started Sales Gravy 13 years ago. And if you were to walk down the street and ask 10 people who sells Gravy, you know, nine of them probably might, might go, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of people who do know. And, you know, and, and it's in our best interest to keep, you know, perpetuating that then you need to go do work to make sure that you're getting that type of brand recognition and, and, and the work that you do is consistent with your brand values. So that, I think that's what's important. Now, I also think that if you're a salesperson and you're working for a brand, you own part of creating that brand awareness and that brand messaging. And, and this wouldn't be true 20 years ago. Like 20 years ago, we wouldn't say, hey, the salesperson really owns the brand. But today, because of social media, because of our online presence, because of the ability for anyone in the organization to talk about the brand in a way that creates mass recognition, as a salesperson, you've got to be part of that machine that creates brand recognition that gets you in the door and then links you to that brand. Mm. It's almost like name dropping, except you're dropping your own name. 
right? At some point. It is name dropping, right? That's exactly right. I mean, you know, I, I name drop all the time. You know, you say it's sales gravy, sales gravy, sales gravy, sales gravy. Yeah. And we don't do enough. Like we could do, I think we could do 10, 20 times more than we're currently doing, but it's hard. Like it's hard for a business to build brand, build a business, grow, hire people, do all those things. It's a very difficult thing to do. So you, you just have to do like, like, like getting your people working, like getting my people working for me is the most important thing I can do because at least I get, I can scale people talking about the brand. But that also means that I got to get my own people connected to the brand, right? My own people have to believe in, uh, in the brand itself and they have to be willing to talk about it and want to talk about it. And I think that's part of your, in, your, your culture on the inside of your organization. You know, they say first you work for the brand and then the, the brand works for you. Like this yes. is exactly that transition, right? First, you have to keep telling people that's the brand, that's the brand, and keep working on it. And then you just relax and just, I'm with Microsoft. That's all you need to say, really. It's true. You know, if, you know, if we had, like, if we had, like, you know, let's just say that we had a 90% recognition that sells gravy is the premier sales training company in the world. So sales gravy and sales training were linked inextricably to each other mm -hmm. in people's minds. You're exactly right. It would just be like it would just be like an annuity. Like we're sitting back and collecting the annuity because what people would do, like I, we need sales training. Well, the first people you call is sales gravy. That doesn't mean we wouldn't have to compete, but they would we would always be in the game. And if you're always in the game, it's easier. So you're exactly right. First, you work for the brand, getting your name out there, but you get more customers, more brand recognition. And what happens is you start creating more internal people coming to you, which makes it a whole lot easier. And by the way, and this is important, when you're in deals and you're competing with good brand recognition, and this is, this is what, and a brand is an emotion, right? So a brand isn't something that's physical. It's, a, it's how people feel about your brand that creates this, right? So with good brand recognition and people trusting your brand, right? They believe that your brand is a safe choice, especially in B2B sales. When you're competing and you're the safe choice, even if you get outsold, people will still pick you. Mm -hmm. And and for example, this happened to me this year where, and in and, and my organization this year, where we were in a deal. It was a really, really, really big deal for us. And we lost. And, and we lost, we lost as fair and square as you possibly can. It was a great company and we learned because they sat down with us and said, would you like to know why you lost? And we said, yes. And they said, you won the deal from a sales standpoint, you outsold everybody, mm. but this thing's really, really big. And we're putting our jobs on the line and we really need to pick the safe choice. So we're picking a company that is bigger than you, that we've worked with in the past, mm. that we, we feel trust to. And, and we didn't pick you just because we're just not willing to take that risk. So think about that. Now, we ended up signing them to something else. We've ended up using the relationship to go in and build trust yep. and then build rent. Ascend. And we've got to build brand recognition in their organization. Yep. Now, I'm going to ex explain. We learned that. Like, we learned we've got, to, we've got to start changing the way our brand looks to people so that we're the safe choice. Like, that was a, like you talk about the major, like that step off point. Like that was like this, this major pivot point for our company back in the fall where we said, we got a problem. We've been this scrappy little boutique company and that's what we've led with. Like we've led with, we're like, we're the scrappy brand. You pick us when you want cool, you want different, you want people that are willing to do it fast, get there, do anything. That works up to a point. But when we, if we want to move into seven figure, sometimes eight figure deals, we're not going to get into those deals if we're not a safe choice. So what do we have to do? Go back to our brand messaging all the way through our presentations, what's happening on, you know, any documents that we give people, our messaging, how we say things. And we still have probably two to three more years of work to build out the whole ecosystem around being a safe choice. And then we have to be a safe choice. Like when people hire us, we have to be that way. But we've got, we got work to do there. But once you get into an organization, you also have to think, it's not just, you know, we talk about branding in terms of the marketplace, right? So I'm branding so people know me. Mm -hmm. but, but I was late to our podcast about 15 minutes because I'm on the phone with one of my largest customers. And when I was at the end, the reason that I had to be late was because they were pitching me on taking more business. And 
and I love you, but I, I'm going to take the business over. I mean, just got to, right? So, but what they you said was- You wouldn't be Joe Blonde if you didn't do that. I mean, come on. That's right. So, <laughs> so what, what the person said was this. So this, this is the, the, their head of L&D said, um, we have a, a sister division and they know about the sales gravy brand. They know about you. His exact words. And I guess apropos for moving in this conversation, but he, exact words. And he says, what they're looking for is how can we get you and your organization working with them? That's brand recognition inside the organization. Mm -hmm. So that's meeting people, you know, doing the right thing, making sure people see you all the time, making sure that they're out there, you know, making sure your coffee cup is on someone's desk. When they walk by, they see sales gravy. They're like, what's that? And they're like, those are the people that train us how to sell. You got to do that kind of stuff. That's what matters the most. So, so if you think about it, like it's not just, it's micro brand recognition and trust, it's macro brand re recognition and trust. And then it's deciding who you're gonna be as a brand. That's gonna evolve over time. And then, and then how are you gonna get there? And if you're a small business like I am, I go back to, man, it is hard. Like it, this is not easy. It's not like I got an entire marketing department out there that's just you know, throwing advertising out and putting their names on stadiums. Like I gotta work at this. Mm -hmm. And, and, and to, to your point, right, brand recognition, familiarity is not just about being a multi-billion dollar brand. It applies to small businesses as well. If, if not even, yes. if not more really, because there's a lot more competition when you're small. Well, there's no doubt. Plus, you know, if you're small, what are you typically doing? Like most small businesses are selling to big businesses, right? So like you're collecting, we call it collecting logos. Like I'm collecting logos. I, you know, I was looking at my logo collection the other day. I'm like, it's a pretty big logo collection. There's a lot of companies in the business with us. So little, but little, but when you're selling to big companies, like that, that, that brand recognition matters. So it matters inside the organization. It matters outside the organization. So, but for a small company, if you think branding, like what is a big company doing? Like FedEx is putting their name on a stadium. Like they've got their name on all their boxes. Watch what they do. Look what Amazon does. I mean, from a branding standpoint, think about this. And this, this is where we go back and think about what Henry Ford said way back in the early part of the, of the, the, the 20th century about advertising, right? So why, if you want to grow, you got to advertise. Like what he was talking about is the Ford brand. Like you got to, you build the brand, you build the brand, you build the brand. Look what Amazon does. Do they need to advertise? Probably not. You know, we're like, I mean, you, they've already won. Like they don't have to advertise to me to get me to buy on Amazon, but what are they doing? They are keeping their brand in front of people day in and day out. And if you think about all of the great brands, that's exactly what they do. The problem that a small business has is they don't have the resources and the money to have a $20 million ad budget or even a million dollar ad budget. And in some cases, not even a $20,000 ad budget. Mm -hmm. So what small businesses have a tendency to do is they, is they spend their money in a lot of cases on digital advertising, looking for conversion. That's part of the picture. And that's where most of us are. Mm -hmm. So like, how are we doing that? Spending money just on building brand recognition, your brand on all your boxes, your brand on everything you do, everywhere you, everything you ship, everything your brand on it that's a different animal it costs more money and and i'm you know i'm here just as a you know as a as a business owner and we've had this conversation before we're behind on that we're we're egregiously behind on it and it's not that we don't know it it's just that you have to stop and think and be intentional mm -hmm. and you got to make sure that your brand is connected to your brand book and your in your messaging and we've got a lot of work to do and you need to set a budget to it. You got to have a budget just for brand building and recognize that that's probably advertising that's going to evaporate. Like you're, it's not going to create a quid pro quo. I advertise, therefore someone walks through my door. That's the hardest thing I think in this world to do. And that's a, it's a big, it's a big issue for us as an organization. It's, uh, it's on my mind every single day. How do we build? How do we build brand? How do we build brand? What about brand recognition? What do we need to do? And, and the, the truth is, is that I wake up every day and I, you know, I jump in and just like today, I started early and I've been running, chasing, I've been chasing a video and a microphone all day long from one thing to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And I'm going to go have a cocktail and think about this conversation and think, 
damn, we need to do more branding. <laughs> but but the, but it's the tr like it's the truth. And 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 I think it's critical that we're as business owners passionate about this and thinking about what are we doing locally to build the brand. And I'm going to give you one more just one more look at this. When I was growing up, there's a, a company um, called Rick's Paint and Body here in the Augusta, Georgia area. Mm -hmm. So if you're from Augusta and you're listening, you'll know Rick's Paint and Body. Now, Rick, um, who at the time I, I dated his daughter, uh, is an, a, an amazing entrepreneur and, uh, and just, uh, just amazing. I mean, he's an incredible guy. And he advertised relentlessly. Like you would never not see a TV that it wasn't talking about Rick's Paint and Body, free estimates over and over and over again. And, um, and, and his business grew and grew and grew and he got really rich making the business grow. And he kept advertising and kept advertising and kept advertising. Well, Rick doesn't own Rick's Paint and Body anymore. Mm. He's not even involved in the business. Someone else does. It's still called Rick's Paint and Body. And why is it still called Rick's Paint and Body? Brand. The goodwill. Right? Yeah, when he sold it, when he sold the, 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 the business, he sold the brand, not the bait and body business. I mean, anybody can do paint and body. But the brand, that's how, that's why it's so important for businesses to think that way. Your insights are amazing. I want to, I want to go back to, to the sales actually side, because this okay. is a question that's tortured me as a business owner, because we've got a, a team of people who, who are in sales and everyone's got their own personalities and uh, preferences. And my question for you is, what's your message for someone who, doesn't feel comfortable reaching out to strangers, making offers. And uh, like, do you suggest that they should just get over it and learn something they feel they're not good at? Or do you recommend that they focus on stuff that they're good at and leave the outreach, outbound sales to someone who feels passionate about that? It, it depends. So I'm going to give you the depends. Hmm. If the person comes in the morning and they would rather throw themselves on a sword and die than reach out and call a stranger probably shouldn't be in sales. Like if they're like, if they're at the point where they, they, they truly cannot function as a human being with the thought of having to call someone that was a stranger, there's probably another role for them. Mm -hmm. However, if you are in a revenue generating situation, so in your organization, essentially you've got a group of, partners. I mean, you've got people out there that do the work, like my trainers. My trainers in the same, the same way your folks who work on trademarks are the same people that do training for me. Mm -hmm. Well, if I have trainers who don't sell, like if they don't sell at all, we'll feed them. I mean, we'll, they're going to get something, but they're not going to be making a lot of money at all because I just don't have enough salespeople to feed every single trainer that I have. But, but, I, but, if, but my trainers that are work, that are, that are like selling, they're making bank, like they're making a lot of money because what do they do? They make the money for the training, like doing the work, they make the commission for the sale. So they get, they get the double dip. If they sell more than they can train, they get other people doing the work for them and they're making the commission on it. So they're doing really, really well. Mm -hmm. So in my world, I don't have, I have more trainers than I have salespeople because it's in my best interest to have my trainers building out accounts, working on deals. Now my trainers aren't necessarily doing cold calls. Like my trainers are typically, we get a deal, we give it to them. Their job is to build that out and expand the relationship. But I have trainers on my team that are, you know, that's, they, they have a hard time like thinking to themselves, I need to do this, need to do this, need to do this. So I've got to work with them to say, listen, you got this deal, what's next? So I have to kind of lead that. But once they get, wake up, they get that. I have some other trainers on my team that are just stone cold cold callers. I mean, they're just bang, 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 looking for Gina, for example. I mean, you just can't stop her. She's so hungry. And in some cases you got to say, well, wait, wait, you got to stop selling stuff because you got too much stuff. You sold too much stuff and you got to handle it. So in that world, they have to do that. So I've got a group of people who are on the spectrum from my son who will, you know, he would cold call in a train, on a plane, you know, in a car, at a bar. I mean, he'll cold call anywhere. And I got other people who I won't name them that I got to kind of push them a little bit and say, here's your list, dial. Mm -hmm. I got to lead that, right? That's important. But as a salesperson, if you say, look, I'm a little bit nervous reaching out and calling strangers, I get that. That's not a psychological is issue. It is neurophysical. And what I mean by that is as a human being, you are naturally averse to being rejected. That could be ostracized. That could be being kicked out of the group. That could be banished, any of those things. 
you're naturally averse to it. And the reason you're naturally averse to it is that is that you know since the beginning of humanity, human beings that that could get along with other people, like who avoid crossing the line to being rejected, were more likely to pass on their genes. And back when we lived in caves, it kept you from getting kicked out of the cave and getting eaten by uh, you know a saber toothed tiger. Right. You know, back in the you know in the Middle Ages, it kept you from being banished from the group and being taken out of the gene pool by a group of marauding you know um, warriors. And today, right, it it helps you get promoted because you're more likable and people are, you're in the in group and it makes your life better. Like you, nobody wants to be lonely. Lonely is horrible, right? So I want to be part of the group. Hmm. And that's why you feel that way. The problem is that if you want to generate an income and you want to generate revenue for your organization, let's just take, you know, take your folks and on your team. Like you, if you want to have a full pipeline of trademarks that you're working on, then you're going to have to go out and have conversations with people. That means that that even though you fear rejection and you're adverse to rejection naturally, you have to go out into the world and find rejection and bring it home. That's the job. That's, that's what you signed up for. I'm just telling you the truth. Now, that doesn't make it any more palatable. It doesn't make it any easier. But what I can tell you is that if you've, if you've ever watched, um, say, or, you know, or paid attention to organizations like Outward Bound, um, or um, you've, you've been in a Tough Mudder race, or you've been in like a Spartan race, or you've done any of those type of events, what those events are about, or maybe you were in the military like and you went through basic training, all of that was about obstacle immunity. In other words, they put you up against a, 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 an uh, adversity or an obstacle that made you feel uncomfortable, like you couldn't get, go there, like it, mm. you felt unsafe, you felt fear, you felt all those things, and they, and they put you up against it, and then you did it, and then they make you do it over and over and over again. And you, and you do it so many times, right, until it no longer feels like an obstacle. Like if you watch a Tough Mudder and they're going around in circles, you know, and they have to hit the same obstacle over and over again over, like, say, a 12-hour race. Hmm. You know, by the time they get to the end of the race, they're, like, walking up to it and going, okay, got to do it again. And they go over it. The first time, they're like, whoa, wow, that's incredible. And they all hesitate and stop. Like, that's how it works. Same thing with outreach. It doesn't feel good. I know it doesn't feel comfortable. You got to make a decision. Like, how bad do you want your income? How bad do you want to, uh, you know, to fill up your pipeline? And then you're going to have to go face the fear and do it again and again and again and again until you feel better about it. That does not mean, Andre, that you are going to feel comfortable. I am not saying that you're going to feel like, oh, this is really easy. There are people who have jumped out of planes 10,000 times. They'll jump out of the plane the 10,000 and first time, but they still feel nervous when they're looking over the edge of the plane, right? Their heart's still beating a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I make, I've made tens of thousands of cold calls, tens of thousands of cold calls. And if I sit down with a list, I can guarantee you the very first call, my heart's beating just a little bit. I feel a little bit nervous. I feel a little bit scared, but I've been, I've learned through obstacle immunity to rise above that emotion which is a, which is neurophysical, right? This is instinctual to not, you know, face face rejection. I've learned how to rise above it and choose my response. So I choose to pick up the phone and make the phone call, right? Versus choosing to allow my instincts, my fear, the inside, the things that are baked inside my DNA to rule me. And that's just basic emotional discipline, which is essentially. Um, it's, we call it cells EQ, but it's emotional intelligence to be aware of my emotion and then be able to deal and manage that emotion so that I can achieve the outcome that I desire. It's just that simple. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, why Jeb is the best of the best of the best of the best. Like, this is amazing. Wow. Um, I remember your point, though, completely dropped my jaw from fanatical prospecting when you said that it's not just about cold calls. Same people have the same reluctance to call existing clients if they yes. they're, if they're looking to upsell them or have another conversation with them. And you're hundred percent right. It's the same emotion that people go through, whether they know the person, whether the person requested a call, or whether they didn't. Um, yes. I have a question for you. You got twelve books for those unfortunate people who may not have known you until now uh, and who have not read a single one. Which one do you recommend they start with? I'll, for most people, I would begin with fanatical prospecting with the caveat that if you're in a situation right now 
where most of your selling is virtual, like, mm. and, and you're in a situation where you're, that's something that you're dealing with, I would start with virtual selling. So I would begin there. So virtual selling will give you the tools that you need to be able to operate in a, in a virtual world and is even phone coming, virtual or is, for, or is virtual online? Phone is, phone is as virtual as you can get, right? Okay. So virtual is anything that you're, you're, you're not face-to-face -face in person. So mm -hmm. phone is virtual, email is virtual, all of those tools. So we take all those tools in virtual selling and we wrap them into how do you get over some of your fear of dealing with people that you can't see because a lot of that comes from there. Uh, if, if, if you're like prospecting is the biggest issue I face, then I would jump into fanatical prospecting first. And if I were to do that, I would read um, fanatical prospecting, sales EQ. I would read objections and inked in that order. And then I would probably weave in virtual selling along the way. And they're all an audio book too. So if you're, if you're not a reader, you can, you can listen. Or if you're like Andre, you buy both, right? So you get the, you get the, the hardcover <laughs> and you get the audio book. And like me, what I'll tell I'll get the hardcover, the ebook, and the audio book of the books that I love, and I'll listen and I'll read when I'm on my phone, and uh, especially books that I read over and over again. Mm. And I think that that uh, Fanatical Prospecting, in particular, is a book that people kind of keep as a guidebook. And super secret hint: there'll be a new version, not a new version, a a supplemental book to Fanatical Prospecting called the Fanatical Prospecting Playbook, mm. which will walk you through how to take the ideas in fanatical prospecting and build that into prospecting sequences uh, so that you can bend the probability that you connect with your prospect using multiple prospecting channels, including the phone. Uh, and uh, and it's, gonna be a, it's gonna be a big guidebook. It's gonna be like a handbook you carry around with you and this is how you get it done. Wow. That'll be out in either November of this year or January of 2022. Wow. Three, so before we wrap this up, what are the three most profound things that allowed you to scale sales gravy to where it is today uh, that you wish you had learned sooner? Well, I think that if I had, if I'd learned a little bit sooner, one of the things I would have done is when I first started the company, I was in the job board business. So I, I, I learned early on, like I, I had this idea of having a portal, information portal, so advertising, stupid. So I got over that, that notion in about four months when I realized that I was going to starve to death if I didn't change my business model. So I moved into an online job board. By 2010, I was the, the market share leader uh, on, in, a, in, you know, in the in niche job board for sales. So I, I owned that space and, and I grew it and it, be, it became a cash machine for me. And, and I should have gotten out of the business in 2012. Should have either sold it or exited it, but I didn't exit it until, believe it or not, 2019. Mm. And, and I, I hung on a little bit long because it was, it was a cash cow, just made cash for us. Until my team basically said, listen, we have to get rid of this business because there's a bigger business, e-learning, and we need to be in that, and we're taking resources away from e-learning. So I had a hard time letting it go because it was my baby, like I built it. So I let it go. I, essentially, I, I, I evaporated a million dollars a year out of our business and I didn't sell the business. I just, I, just, I just quit doing it because I didn't want to, it wasn't worth trying to go through the process of selling because my brand was attached to it and mm -hmm. I didn't, I was, the brand wasn't for sale. And we switched over and within 90 days, we made up for the million plus more and we changed the trajectory of our business. So one of the things, number one, would have been to, to let go emotionally earlier on. And, and mm. that would have been probably the people that I had around me, bringing them in more into strategic decisions, which I hadn't done up to that point. And the reason this came to the surface is that we were running these, these strategic sessions with the team to basically rethink the organization, put values around the brand. And in those conversations, these really smart people who had around me were like, you got to get rid of this. And I was like, no, 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 no. And they were like, you got to get rid of it. And so finally they taught me. <laughs> Number two, isn't something that I thought, I wish I'd known earlier. It was just something that I learned uh, or something that we did that helped us scale massively. And, uh, and that is, has been the willingness to, um, to grow through messy success. Like I just have this belief that, you know, that, that messy success is way better than perfect mediocrity. 
So we do a lot of stuff. Like I'm sitting in this studio right now. I have a studio complex. I have five studios here. I've got a production crew. I do things that nobody else in the world does. And uh, we're running like broadcast level production. This is the clubhouse. So this is a self-produced set that I'm on right now that allows us to have these type of intimate conversations. And, uh, and we, we, you know, we built this from the ground up. But I burnt a lot of money. I spent about a million dollars doing this, but I probably spent $250,000 failing before we built this mm. because I, I invested in things that didn't work. I tried things that didn't work. I did those things that didn't work. We've done a lot of that. We've made a lot of mistakes over time that, you know, that didn't work. Number three is uh, that we hired really good people and we invested in people. And early on in the business, now I've been, one, one thing I'll say, we've been very, very careful. We don't owe anybody any money. We don't have any investors outside of us. We are, we produce about a 70% EBITDA. So if you just want to do the math on that, we produce a lot of cash. Like, and and it's, so we're a cash driven company. And we're able to do that because we're insanely conservative in how we run our finances. We don't take risk that break the company. So we take risk, but we don't take risk to break the company. Mm -hmm. Sadly, though, one of the things that I did for a long time was I didn't go spend money to hire great people because I didn't want to take a risk of hiring a person and wasting a lot of money. So my con being I was too risk averse, too conservative. And and as we got to a place where like you couldn't keep doing that, you realize that talent solves a lot of problems. Like talent always finds a way to win. And, and so we, you know, we started making some, some significant moves uh, on both, both exiting people in the organization that were holding us back and then bringing on people that were taking us to the next level. And, and those were risks that like, I would never take before. Like, and I know every business owner that's listening to this knows what I'm talking about. Like you're thinking, if I hire this person it doesn't work out, I just burned like 70 grand. And, and, and if I, I wish that earlier on in the business, I had been willing to take some of those risks because I, I think we would have been in a different place right now. I think we would have been be even bigger. We would have hit some of the goals that I wanted to hit. But, um, but once we started making, taking those risks, it's a lot easier to take the risk. It's a lot easier to bring the person on and still be extremely conservative with your financial situation so that you don't make stupid mistakes that set you back. And it's easier to get good people with good brand. It is a lot easier to get good people with a good brand. And by the way, that's true. As Sales Gravy's brand recognition has grown, more people come to us and say, hey, I'd like to work there than before. So brand recognition plays a big role in your ability to recruit good people. Absolutely no doubt. Wow. You got full circle, right? Full circle. Look at that. Mind blowing, right? Oof. Wow. Look, I, I, I knew this was going to be an amazing interview. I'm really beyond grateful to you for spending your time and sharing your wisdom. This, this, this is phenomenal. And um, I'm hoping that people who are going to watch this are going to enjoy this as much as I did, going to learn as much as I did, and are going to use that to build their amazing brands, their amazing businesses. And they're going to find you through salesgravy.com. Is that the best way to, to, yeah, you to find go to you sales, Yeah, go to salesgravy.com, the easiest way. Uh, you can also go to my own personal website, so uh, jebblount.com, jebblunt.com. So you can go there. You can check out my books out on uh, on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or wherever books are sold. You can also go to my YouTube channel, forward slash Sales Gravy. And I highly recommend, if you like this, go to Spotify or to iTunes or to Google Play or to Android or wherever you get your podcast and uh, go grab the Sales Gravy Jeb Blunt podcast. Either type my name in or type Sales Gravy in, you'll find us. If you're in a business, you need sales. And if you need sales, you got to learn from the best. Here's the person who's who's the person to learn from. Jeb, thanks again. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andre. Appreciate it. All right. Well, here you have it. This was Jeb Blunt with Sales Gravy sharing with you his wisdom about how to sell, how to build a great brand, and why having a great brand will help you make more sales. Uh, if you found this video useful, Post your comment below, like this, subscribe, and again, follow Jeb, follow Trademark Factory, follow kick Brand Show, and I'll see you in the next video.
Yeah.